Hello and welcome to another video. It's really crazy to think that 1990 was 30 years ago. And that's how old the laptop is we're going to try and fix today. It's from 1990. I actually got it off of eBay for $40, but it was being sold as for parts not working. And from the seller's description, it seems as if the hard disk has failed. That's probably a pretty bad thing given how old the laptop is. Anyway, if you'd like to support the channel a little bit more, you can click join down below and become a member of the channel. Anyway, also a big thank you to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. So, let's open up the box and see what we've got. Using my trusty knife, I dug my way into the box. This wasn't exactly what I was expecting. Well, at least I can see the seller didn't skimp out on packing peanuts. Either way, it looks like they've helped the laptop arrive safely. And I've made quite a big mess. At least I can pretend it's snowing. First impressions are pretty good. Cosmetically, it's in great shape. Along with a lot of laptops from this time period, there's a neat little carrying handle. Before I even think of powering it up, let's check that the battery hasn't leaked inside. Thankfully, it's easy to get access to. It looks like an old school lead acid battery. I can feel where most of the laptop's weight was coming from. I'm also really thankful that the battery hasn't leaked, because that could cause a lot of corrosion. Even though it's a hefty battery, it wouldn't have powered the laptop for very long at all. With it safely back in, I now need to get a compatible charger. The adapter needs to be 9 volts at at least 2.4 amps. I searched through all my power supply tubs, but didn't find a match. One rainy day trip to JCAR solved this problem. They had exactly what I needed, and you could easily change the polarity, which was super important for this laptop. I kind of just hoped that it came with a plug that was the right size. Here goes nothing. After pressing in the power button, it made some beepy noises and entered the BIOS. After adjusting my camera's shutter speed to match the display, the picture looked pretty clean. I fiddled around with the settings and let it try to boot up. Ooh, 549 kilobytes of RAM, that isn't a lot. It sat trying to detect the hard drive for quite some time. Eventually, it displayed the error 1780. I put an MS-DOS 6.22 installer floppy in to see whether it could detect the hard drive. I kept getting errors and the floppy drive struggled to eject the disk. But after a bit of fiddling, it managed to get into the MS-DOS setup. Unfortunately, it does not detect any hard disk either. So the laptop does thankfully start up. Everything seems to work apart from the battery and of course the hard disk. Although let's be real, for a laptop that's 30 years old, there wasn't much of a chance that the battery was gonna work, was there? The next step is to crack it open and see what lies within. On the base, there are eight screws I had to remove. Now I could gently lift up the top casing. From here, I could remove the keyboard, which was attached to the motherboard via a small ribbon cable. Before we see what's inside this relic from the past, here's a word from today's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. If you want to browse the internet more securely, protect your identity online, and access region-specific content, this is the VPN for you. It works by encrypting all the data you send and receive over the internet. Your subscription includes 24-7 live customer support, the ability to connect to two VPN servers at once, and most importantly, an automatic kill switch, which protects you from accidental exposure if the server connection is interrupted. All you've got to do is open Surfshark, click connect, and you can tunnel through and browse as if you were in another country or region. There are so many servers to choose from. Don't have Mac OS? That's no problem as Surfshark VPN has an app for every major browser and operating system. This includes iOS as well as Android. I've found this pretty useful for connecting to the far superior American Netflix from here in Australia. You can try Surfshark VPN for yourself using my link and promo code that are in the description. This will get you 85% off and three extra months for free. They're offering a 30 day risk-free money back guarantee. So why not try it today? Once again, big thank you to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. Now back to that really old computer. There were three connectors I had to detach before the top casing could come off. Here are the rather simple internals. Powering this laptop is a 10 megahertz NEC V40 CPU which is equivalent to an Intel 8088 of that time period. It's a bit dusty inside, so we'll be sure to clean it out later in the video. First of all, let's remove that hard disk to learn a bit about it. 
The drive is held in a rubber mounted bracket to reduce vibration. I carefully dislodged the small ribbon cable and lifted the drive out. On the top there was a weird sticky residue. I believe someone likely spilt something on the keyboard and over the years it's seeped through. Peeling back the ribbon cable reveals this is a Connor CP4044, a 42 megabyte 3.5 inch super slimline hard drive. Taking a closer look, the connector is much smaller than a standard IDE interface. That may make finding a replacement a lot harder. To see if the drive would still show any signs of life, I listened to the drive carefully. It made some noises and did light up briefly, so at the very least it wasn't completely dead. There are two sets of jumpers on the PCB of the hard disk. With the information I found online, I tried some different configurations. Doing this will address the drive as D instead of C. At this point I was basically going to try anything I could think of. I loosely placed it back together to see what would happen. Once again it sat there for a while before displaying a slightly different error message. Controller failed 1782, meaning it didn't even see the hard disk, working or not. For interest's sake, I thought I'd try booting up the laptop without the hard disk installed at all. The error message we got was once again 1782, meaning whatever I did to the jumpers made the system not even detect the drive. With this knowledge, I put the jumpers back to their original configuration and plugged the hard disk back in. And what do you know, we get the original error message of Unit 0 Error 1780. I tried other jumper configurations which didn't appear to make any differences. A few people online said this drive is just IDE. Well, it simply isn't. The connector is a lot smaller and the pinout may actually be different. From the research I've done, this interface appears to be something called SSL IDE, but sadly there's very little about it online. And at the very least, I'd have to make my own custom adapter or cable. To see if there was absolutely anything I could do with this laptop in its current form, I made some older MS-DOS boot disks. If you want to do the same, I left a link in the description. I'm using Windows XP as I had trouble doing this in Windows 10. The first version I wanted to try was MS-DOS 3.3, which is what this laptop would have come pre-installed with. It also didn't detect the hard disk. I went ahead and installed Commander Keen onto the boot floppy disk. It actually attempted to run, but couldn't find a compatible graphics card. Even after I clicked yes to continue, it didn't do anything. Another DOS game I installed onto the boot floppy was Captain Comic. It loaded the first screen and let me define the control inputs, but it failed while trying to write to the floppy disk. The next idea I had was trying to use an MS-DOS 5.0 boot floppy. This gives me access to a lot more tools and I can actually try typing in QBasic. I tried about 5 other games, all of which had similar problems. My next idea was to try and connect another floppy drive to the connector on the motherboard. To power the floppy drive, I used an old Windows ME computer that I cleaned up in a video last year. With the floppy drive plugged in, I powered up both machines at the same time to see what would happen. The answer to that, unfortunately, was nothing. The laptop showed no signs of life with the floppy drive plugged in. Well, this isn't good. How about I try to plug in a standard IDE hard drive? Wait, never mind, this is a much bigger connector, one with 50 pins. Perhaps this is for a SCSI drive. With all other options exhausted, let's try opening up the hard disk and the floppy drive. After removing four Phillips head screws, the rubber mounted floppy drive can come out. After unclipping the metal casing, we've got our first look inside the floppy drive. It's interesting to see how the disks are inserted and ejected. When I first got the machine, it struggled to eject disks, but after using it for a bit, it ejects them fine now. To get in further, I tried to remove the circuit board on the top. However, there were several other ribbon cables that I couldn't get easy access to, so I decided to stop. Since I'd gotten this far, I used some isopropyl alcohol to clean the heads. To lubricate the motor, I used some WD-40. One thing I did mess up is the alignment of the sensor that detects when the head has reached the end. I tried to remove it when I was taking off that PCB on the top, and now the drive doesn't function. After several attempts, I got the alignment right and the drive was thankfully reading discs once again. The hard disk was the next component I wanted to take apart. I really wanted to be careful as this drive, working or not, is kind of rare now. Oof, yikes, that doesn't look good. The foam has turned into a sticky mess. 
It now resembles the tar that's used to make roads. I began scraping it all off, which wasn't as easy as I'd thought it would be. It also turns out that there was a lot more under this paper sheet. I got the bulk of it off, the rest I had to scrub off with a toothbrush doused in isopropyl alcohol. There was still some on the circuit board. After pushing it off, I realized that it had actually started to corrode the solder points. And after quite a bit of cleaning, it did look better, but you could definitely tell where the disintegrated foam had been. The rest of the hard disk was also looking a whole lot cleaner. To see if what we'd done had actually made any difference, I put the hard disk back together. When the system started up, I waited with my fingers crossed, and it still had the 1780 drive error. Even in MS-DOS, it was still unable to detect the hard drive. I was really baffled by this. The drive showed signs of life, made some noises, and the light turned on. Yet, it still wouldn't run or even be detected. I was honestly quite frustrated at this point. The only thing left to do was to open up the hard disk. Since the drive didn't seem to work, I really didn't have anything to lose. With the hidden screw removed, I took out the six Torx T7 screws before carefully prying up on the lid. The rubber seal made this a little bit difficult to do. There we have the internals of a 30 year old 42 megabyte hard drive. There is a single drive platter. The whole thing doesn't look too much different to what you'd find today. I'm not sure if it's supposed to look like this, but you can actually see the lines on the platter. Are these scratches? Or do really old drives normally look like this? Out of curiosity, I ran the drive with the casing off to see what it would look like. So, with the hard disk open, I thought I would simply try booting the system up. And what do you know, the hard disk actually started working. It loaded into this weird software interface I have never seen before. The headline at the top is Neil's Juicy Main Menu. Uh, I really don't know what makes a menu juicy. And quite frankly, I don't want to know. Honestly, I was ecstatic. I could not believe that after all this work, I got it to finally fire up. Straight after, I unplugged the drive, made sure there was no debris, and quickly put it back together. It was now time to give the laptop a much deserved clean out. A lot of the dirtiness was easily brushed off. I'll give the casing a dose of eucalyptus soil once it's all back together. The hinge was definitely quite creaky. I thought it was a good time to open up the display assembly and make the hinge as strong as possible. The original user manual, which you can actually find online, tells you how to do all of this, which is pretty awesome. There are four small pads that cover the screws. Once removed, I unclip the plastic backing. And here's the CFL bulb that works as the display backlight. The manual also says that it should last about 10,000 hours of operation. I applied some thread locker to all the hinge screws to hopefully strengthen them. Although the hinge was creaking, it wasn't broken thankfully. This piece of glass with a white backing is what diffuses the backlight, making it appear more evenly on the display. While I had the panel open, I also applied thread locker to some of the other structural screws. The assembly could now be pieced back together. In an effort to perhaps loosen the stiff hinges, I applied some WD-40. After dusting out the keyboard, I scrubbed it with a toothbrush that had some isopropyl alcohol on it. This was very effective at cleaning it up. I also went around the case and cleaned up any grubby areas. The reassembly could now begin. I'm very glad I got the hard disk working once more. Before I put the keyboard back on, I removed any gunk that was around the edges. Relievingly, the laptop and the screen were both still functional. Before we check out what's on the laptop, I gave it a clean with some eucalyptus oil. First of all, let's try some word processing. After the cleaning, it's great to see that the keyboard still functions correctly. In the DOS utilities, there are many options for formatting drives. Buster Advanced version 3.2 by Leprechaun Software is an antivirus from what I understand. I wasn't exactly sure what to do, but I eventually worked out how to quit the program. Whatever games were installed here don't seem to work, which is a shame. Xtree seems to be a program that lets you easily explore the directories on your hard drive. I had less luck trying to run Lotus123, which just came up with a CPU-related error code. Another program installed on here is called Solution6. Some sort of primitive accounting software, maybe. Once again, I tried to install Commander Keen. This time, I could install it right to the hard disk. Although, same as last time, it couldn't find a supported graphics card. Whatever settings I tried to use, Lemmings would not work either. A few of the programs on this interface sadly aren't installed at all. 
I did try installing some DOS games, sadly, none of which I could get working. As far as I'm aware, the system simply doesn't have the graphical capabilities. Although Duke Nukem kind of worked, the, the sound was working, and because I know the first level, I actually managed to get through some of it. After upgrading the MS-DOS version to 6.2, I thought I'd have a swing at trying to install Windows 3.1, but this laptop simply doesn't have the capabilities to do so. This was quite a small laptop for 1990. Not a whole lot of connectivity though. At the back, there was definitely an option for more ports. Having a neat carry handle really made this very portable. The keyboard is definitely not great. I guess it may have degraded somewhat over the last 30 years. So there we have a true relic from the past. This is definitely a very compact laptop for 1990, although its performance is definitely underwhelming. I couldn't even install Microsoft Windows 3.1, because this doesn't even have a 286. Either way, a lot of time was spent on this video, and I'm very glad I managed to get it running once again. And if you like my content, definitely consider becoming a channel member. For the Eucalyptus Oil Squad, there'll be a behind the scenes video out in a few days. Anyway. Ooh. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. If you've liked this video, feel free to leave a like. And if you want to see more, definitely consider subscribing. Also, big thank you to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. I'll see you next time.